Well, hello and welcome to the Digital Signature Podcast. Uh, this is a series of conversations with computing professionals about their journeys through their careers in technology and a little tour of a day in the life of technologists from lots of different perspectives. Uh, my name is Bill Mongan. Uh, this is episode two, and uh, we're joined today by Adam Zucker. Uh, hello, Adam. Uh, Today, uh, we're, we're going to meet uh, Adam and get to know more about him. Uh, Adam is a staff data scientist. Uh, and uh, prior to that, uh, he majored in uh, chemistry at Ursinus College, where I'm a faculty. Uh, and during his time there, he uh, actually interned with the, the FBI uh, and served as a, a teaching assistant there and a research assistant and all kinds of just really good pay it forward uh, kinds of things. Uh, so, uh, Adam, thanks for joining us. Yeah, of course. And yeah, that about covers it. I would say that I'm one year into my data science career and I love it. But yeah, like you said, uh, a year removed from my chemistry degree. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that a little bit, uh, that uh, you uh, kind of, in a way, made a transition on paper from uh, from experimental sciences uh, to, to computing and computer science. But uh, I suspect there's a lot of overlap there, and I'm I'm really excited to to kind of dig into that. Uh, um, and actually, that's that's really the first question I have for you. So, um, you know, when we hear the word science, uh, a lot of times we think about um, the science that you majored in, like chemistry or or, or biology, and, and these things that that I call uh, experimental sciences. Um, so, uh, but now you're in this field that uh, we would call data science. So, um, what is data science to you, and uh, what got you interested in that? Data science to me, and let's, um, about science in general, science, in my opinion, is really about uh, the scientific method and where you can apply it. So we see the scientific method in a number of different fields. It doesn't necessarily have to be just a hard science like biology and chemistry. We see it in psychology, sociology. So the science for me, or data science for me, is applying the scientific method to data. Oftentimes, it's trying to, you know, extract business insights from data, really try to get as much value from it as possible. And this comes into play with a lot of different um, experimentation. And I think oftentimes in popular media, data science gets conflated with machine learning. But really, data science is an all-encompassing field that can use tools like machine learning, statistics, but really the sole pursuit is to get as much information out of data and produce insights from that as possible. Yeah, I, that, that's really helpful because I, I'm going to ask you a little bit about some of the connections to, uh, to AI and, and machine learning. And uh, uh, maybe before we do that, we'll talk a little bit about the, the kind of slice of data science that you do, because even within data science, this idea of, 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 of doing experiments with data to make inferences there are all these different subfields and ways to apply that to so many things around us. Uh, uh, I know you're going to share an activity with us later on um, about classifying uh, authentic uh, written text. Um, and uh, we have uh, a kind of a social studies type activity too, where uh, we look at the Federalist Papers. And um, these uh, use a kind of a subfield uh, called natural language processing uh, or NLP, and I understand that's where your uh, kind of thrust is. Um, can you can you tell us a, a little bit about uh, what that is? Like, what is what is natural language processing, and how does that relate yeah. to data science? Sorry, yeah, yeah. So to give an overview of natural language processing, also dubbed NLP, uh, the most concise way would be to say that it is processing um, text in a way that a computer can understand. Because just from you know, a simple overview of computers, computers work best with numbers, right? So text is something that's unique to them in that they are not automatically able to understand it. So NLP is really processing the data in such a way that it makes it um, a computer can understand it. And let's one one uh, like this might seem pretty like a niche topic, but we really see it everywhere in our lives. Um, when you go to Google Translate to say, how are you, try to learn how are you in French, that uses NLP, machine like language translation, that's an NLP task. When you tell your Alexa that you want to buy uh, AirPods, that's an NLP task. When you don't get spam emails, your spam filter in your email, that's NLP. Um, your computers are under learning, um, trying to understand what you say and derive meaning out of it, or they're looking just being able to derive meaning from text. So it's pretty ubiquitous throughout our lives. Yeah, that's that's interesting. You got me thinking about, um, 
I, I, I have um, like an internet uh, radio on my phone uh, that I can, I can Bluetooth in my car and it's, and it's voice activated. And, and so just the other day I was driving around and I, I said, um, you know, play a certain radio, you know, play some radio station. But I, oh, that's all I said was just play this station. And I didn't tell it what app to run. I didn't tell it, you know, to use, um, you know, uh, uh, this, this radio app or this website or anything like that. I just said, put this station on, play this artist, play this, whatever. Um, and it, and it did. And, and I thought about that as I was, I was kind of sitting there driving along and all of a sudden my song is playing. I thought, and I wonder how it knew not only that I wanted that station, it, yeah, you know, that it, it could hear those words and, and translate them into text. And, uh, and that's a, a big part of what, what NLP does. Um, but I, it also got me thinking, it also was able to figure out that that station was associated with that app and it got the right app running without any input from me at all. And uh, uh, so to have that uh, kind of uh, meta level of information to be able to associate those things, uh, that's really interesting too. And I, I would imagine that, uh, that a part of uh, NLP would involve doing some, uh, some of this, uh, uh, what I, I imagine is called metadata, this uh, information about the data that, well, this is the radio station, these are the words that describe it, but here's what it means. It's this genre and it's this, uh, uh, these, these artists and this application and, and this and that and the other. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it's just, just the, the complexity that went into something that just seemed so mundane was, was really kind of interesting to me. I, I think you sort of touched on that. Absolutely. And I think a lot of times too, NLP is kind of the face almost of AI that we see in popular media. When people talk about AI becoming sentient, you, uh, there was a recent, like, uh, little stir about a Google engineer talking to a chatbot and who he believed became sentient chatbots. That's, that's NLP right there. So I feel like we see it all in our lives and that's kind of what we see when we think of AI becoming sentient, when that gets really good at NLP is able to understand and almost think for itself and, you know, speak back to us, uh, speak, I say um, in quotes, but yeah, it, it really is interesting, especially at those like very tougher tasks like machine translation and trying to derive meaning from when we speak to uh, a machine. Yeah, right. And and uh, uh, there's uh, uh, this concept of the the, the the Turing test, and can you uh, can you speak with uh, an, an AI and and be convinced uh, that you are speaking with a human uh, versus um, a computer, and this uh, raises lots of, um, you know, really interesting questions about, um, you know, to what extent is it okay to automatically communicate with someone like a chatbot or, a, you know, automated customer service uh, rep, or, um, you know, how deep does that go into maybe giving automated medical advice? Uh, and if, if, if it's not really clear, if, if, if we're at such a place that um, we can make convincing uh, natural language, um, it, you know, to what extent do we need to inform people that they're that they're potentially dealing with something that is a machine and uh, um, and not a human um, a human uh, counterpart? And uh, a lot of ethical questions there. And in fact, um, that is the subject of a, an upcoming episode. We're going to have a whole episode dedicated to to those questions. Uh, and uh, I'll be meeting with a, a sociologist. So I'm glad you uh, you touched on that. There's some there's some good uh, foreshadowing there. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. So, and that's, and that's just natural language processing. Um, so what, um, you know, you are primarily a data scientist. Uh, so what, um, what, what does data science as a whole look like for you in practice? Uh, what's, a, what's a typical uh, day or week or month uh, in the life uh, look like for you? So it's like I mentioned, it is very much the scientific process, the scientific method. I will come up with a hypothesis uh, regarding, you know, some goal that I want to achieve, whether it's um, how to improve this model to get this much more accuracy, um, like what kind of, uh, like what kind of, um, like work need that need, I, or what kind of hypothesis do I test to determine whether or not a model will be improved more. Um, and data science really, it's a lot like software engineering in a way, in that we're writing a lot of code. It's very structured in that sense. And we're also, well, we're using the code to um, do this sort of life data life cycle, where we're first exploring the data, trying to get insights from it, just on the face, you know, using descriptive statistics. Um, and then we're trying to decide whether, you know, we can apply machine learning to it. 
and um, if machine learning is even necessary, because that's one of the real questions uh, a data scientist and a good machine learning practitioner should be able to answer whether or not machine learning should be applied to a given problem. And then it's really we're put, uh, putting the science and data science where we're running experiments, you know, training machine learning models, um, evaluating those models, writing up our conclusions and seeing if they validated our hypothesis and then going back and, you know, running more experiments if it didn't align with what we initially thought and we create a new hypothesis as a result. Um, it's very cyclical process, but very much a scientific one. Yeah, that uh, makes a lot of sense. You mentioned uh, an interesting term uh, earlier. I think it was uh, descriptive statistics, like collecting and capturing these uh, statistics that that can inform uh, some decision that you make. Um, what, what tell us what that what that means uh, uh, in case uh, folks out there haven't heard of that before. What is a descriptive statistic or a statistic? Yeah. So when you have a data set, there's just some information about it that you would want to know on its face. Um, when you're dealing a lot with numbers, there's a couple, and if you have a numerical data set, there's a couple numbers you would want to know. One being the average, the mean, you know, what is the, you know, average value of the data set, the median, um, and standard deviation, just seeing where numbers lie with respect to each other. And this can be applied to text too, seeing what words are most frequent, um, you know, um, seeing the var variations of the words themselves, just trying to get an understanding of the data set on its face without having to, you know, comb through meticulously, just getting like a broad understanding that can be um, easily um, disseminated and um, presented to other people, just so they can get a sense of what kind of data set you're working with without having to have that like in-depth knowledge that you have about it. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, kind of, yeah, like building this, this, this abstract or aggregate model that, you know, if a, a, you know, if you, you, it, it's helpful in one hand to know that, okay, I took these tests in a class and I got a, an 80 and a 90 and an 85 and a, and a 90. And, uh, but it's, it's more helpful to just look at that on the whole and say, well, I, I, I was a B student and now I'm an A student, you know, like I trended in a direction in general by taking the average or taking some some describing well descriptive uh, statistics um, that makes yeah. a lot of sense and actually that's a question i, I plan to ask you about um so we might as well talk about it uh, which was um you know I, I was curious like the kinds of math and computing that are useful to nlp or, or data science generally um and i think you kind of answered part of it uh, that you know certainly that it, it, there would be some statistics involved um, and, uh, and you had mentioned software engineering too, and I was really glad you mentioned that because yes, you can specialize in this field of, 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 of data science that uh, if, you're a, if you're in a school, you, you may never have heard of before. And yet you're kind of doing those things uh, a little bit in your math classes and in your, uh, even in your, in, your, in your computing class, if you're fortunate enough to have a, a CS class. Uh, that you know you you have to start by making software, and if if you don't have the skills to do that, uh, then um, you know you you can't kind of build on top of that. So uh, there's this nice foundation of uh, that uh, that everybody kind of has this common language, um, and then you can really specialize in some really interesting spaces. So um, uh, so I was glad you mentioned that, and uh, I, I wonder um, maybe that's everything. But are there other are there other uh, skill sets, uh, I guess, uh, maybe is the best way to say that you think are useful um, in, in data science. So there's a ton and probably too many to go into in this discussion, but I can really talk about what I use. Um, as far as the software component itself and the programming, you really can't go wrong with Python. Now, there are a number of different uh, programming languages people use to solve their problems, but a lot of times in industry that I've seen so far, it's usually the go-to is Python because it's so versatile and so, um, you know, you can apply it to any problem. So that's what I'm mostly using when I'm producing my solutions. But as far as the math and the background that you need in that, I would say having a fundamental understanding of statistics, um, linear algebra and calculus are pretty necessary. But 
the beautiful thing about doing data science and machine learning today is that there are a ton of software libraries out there that can handle really the, the bulk of the math for you, the most intricate low level parts. And just having an understanding of those maths to understand the data itself is useful, but you're never gonna have to, you know, um, solve a derivative yourself through code. You have libraries that can do that for you. But when it comes to um, the part where math really comes in, understanding the math behind a model and having that intuition about how to improve it is when you're trying to, you know, debug a model's performance or just um, debug, you know, any of your statistical analysis. Like you really want to have that intuition but like I said, you don't need to, you're not the one who's implementing the low level stuff. Yeah, that's a really great point. And, uh, you know, especially you mentioned like taking derivatives and um, I, I think it's, it's I, I know at least when I was in school, I didn't have a good sense of why am I learning derivatives? And what, you know, when I went to college, I was thinking, why am I learning linear algebra? And yet I use those things every day today. But um, but the, the big thing is it like, it, and you said it, it's, it's not, it's not that you're going to, come out of school or, or come out of your, your uh, preparation and training and you're gonna be like solving derivatives and doing the chain rule on paper all by yourself. Um, you know, that probably doesn't happen very often, but, uh, but understanding what a derivative is that, oh, it's like a slope, it's a rate of change. And, and if I had a, a graph that could describe for me um, how many words I'm getting correct uh, when I'm translating speech into text, uh, well, if I follow the slope of that line and, and until I get to the lowest spot, if I know it's going this way, this way, this way, I can follow that curve and almost slide on it like a sliding board um, until I find the lowest point and I say, oh, I'm making the fewest mistakes now. And um, it's sort of like knowing how derivatives can help you to ask questions about the data that you're looking at um, and how statistics can help you to ask questions about the things you're looking at. And so it helps to know what a derivative is and how to take derivatives and, uh, and, and those kinds of things. But um, there's, there's like a broader set of skills there that, you know, uh, that contextualizes things a little bit. Like, why is this important? Why do I need this? And, uh, um, and so I, I think that's a, that's a great example and uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, so another, um, and that kind of you mentioned uh, like programming tools and languages, and yeah, I know a lot of a lot of data scientists and machine learning folks, and myself included. Uh, we we really like to use Python uh, because it comes with a lot of cool libraries, so you don't have to go building everything yourself all the time. And I know you've prepared a cool uh, demo and example for us that we're going to see um, on another uh, another feature, uh, which we'll have up on the website soon. But um, uh, I wonder, um, and actually you in particular, you know, your background in computing, you started out with basically one class in Java. In fact, that's how we met. That was that was my class, and uh, and that was that was a Java class, a, a programming uh, course. Um, and so you kind of took that and, and sort of turned the corner into not only Python, but uh, one of the things that that's that's honestly really impressed me about uh, what you've done is that um, you know with that one class with one uh, introduction um, you uh, really dug pretty quickly into these these subfields uh, and uh, you know and really kind of dug deep and so um, so I was wondering if you could maybe talk to two things at once here uh, this idea of um, you know, that there are languages that can be helpful for certain types of problems. Um, and yet, if you didn't study those languages, that's kind of okay, too. Uh, because it's, you know, if you have a certain preparation, you can you can pivot uh, really easily. And, uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, flexible, malleable kind of versatile field. So, um, so maybe we can tease those two things out. Maybe you can you can talk with us a little bit about just your own preparation and training the, the skills um, that uh, that that you did uh, because they you know you didn't do a ton while you were in college, um, and so what things did you pick up and pivot uh, after you got out? And did you did you find that you know easy or hard or how how was that experience for you? Yeah, so like you mentioned, I took one computer science class during the spring semester of my senior year, and now I do wish I took more, but I'm really happy I took that one. So maybe also um, bringing in a little bit about how I got into data science. Um, so I really didn't choose data science. It kind of chose me in the sense that my, com my current company, I had applied for a different position with them, but they had this program essentially um, to teach up uh, employ like people um, in data science. 
And what ended up happening was I joined this program and just having that one class in Java, even though my program was in Python, it gave me such an advantage just being able to come into it and understand basic computer science fundamentals, programming syntax. So there were people in this program who had never even coded before. And I felt like I was a leg up on them because I had this, um, this Java introductory experience. But going from that, and even after the program, I still didn't feel comfortable calling myself a data scientist. I'm very fortunate to be at a company that prioritizes um, their employees' education and upskilling. Mm -hmm. So throughout my time there, I've had access to uh, educational um, websites like Udemy, um, Coursera. Mm -hmm. So I've been able to use these and take self-paced course outside of work. And I've learned a lot uh, about data science on the job. But having these courses that you can take at your own pace with these brilliant instructors online was, it's incredibly fortunate. And although I'm lucky to have a company that has a subscription to these websites, a lot of these courses are only like $20. They're very accessible and cheap and even provide you with certificates after completion. So you do have something to put on your resume. So it's really the culmination of both on the job and these courses that these on-demand courses that I've been able to really build up my foundation and obviously getting the, yeah, the chance to apply it on the job is number one, but uh, there is something to be said about the plethora of resources that are out there online that were maybe, you know, inaccessible a couple of decades ago. You couldn't really learn it on your own. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really where it's come from or where I came from. Yeah, that that helps. I you know, and, and some of them are even free. I, I I've been really impressed with uh, the the content that people are creating, and uh, uh, and and, uh, and and I mean, we're even going to have on our website here uh, uh, some curated uh, kind of toolkits for teachers and students. And um, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a computer science class in your 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 high school or your even your middle and elementary school, like that's that's great. But chances are you don't, or you only have one. Um, and the teacher might be on their own in the in the building. You know they don't have a lot of a lot of uh, colleagues um, in that space. And so uh, we're looking to really curate a lot of these uh, resources about just how to get engaged, how to get involved. Um, you know, and try to make that world a little bit smaller. Um, and uh, and so um, yeah, there's there's a lot out there. Uh, and um, you know, certainly majoring in computer science is one field, one path. But um, you know, even nowadays, if you look at a lot of higher eds. They're offering software engineering degrees now um, and uh, computer security degrees. And uh, we're starting to see this partitioning happen. Uh, and so, and that can be very confusing if when you come out of high school, all you've ever heard of is computer science. And so, um, so there are these, yeah, there are lots of websites and, and online resources and we'll try to curate those uh, here for everybody um, so that they can kind of dabble and explore. And it's just totally low stakes. There's nothing, nothing to risk, nothing to lose and see what you like. Um, you know, another thing that's really exciting, I think, about, about the field is that there's so many different areas. Like, I'm actually not really a natural language processing person. That's not an area that I dive into, but I do some, some AI and machine learning. And so we have uh, a lot in common there that we can talk about. And, you know, eventually you, you boil back to a place where we have a lot of really common language and, and you have a lot, of, a lot of common collaborators, even though Two people sitting next to each other might do totally different things. I think that's really exciting, and uh, those kinds of resources can give you a way to, to explore and see what you're into and um, see what the field is all about. Glad you glad you brought that up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my last, uh, I think I just have one more question for you. Um, so, uh, and, and it has to do with this connection, this this sort of uh, common ground, for example, um, that like uh, data science and uh, and I'd imagine uh, NLP as well. Uh, could connect uh, probably pretty strongly to artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and these kinds of things. Um, and I know you're going to show us an example of that soon. And um, so I was wondering if you could tell us what, like, what does that mean? You used the word uh, model earlier. And so if you're modeling or you're classifying if text was written by a bot or written by a human, um, what does that mean to model something? And how, how do you go about doing that? Yeah, so I guess there's a lot of different ways you can think about it. But really, if you think about maybe the most, um, if you think, uh, the example I always go back to in my head, because I think it's really easy to understand, is going back to your algebra days and thinking about 
like equations like why like a equation for a line like y equals mx plus b and imagine you're given these inputs and you're trying to decide what do x and b mean you know so really um for me for trying to model something trying to model data is like um trying to find those parameters that fit that data oh. and be able to then given your own inputs produce something produce an output um it really that's a very simplistic way of understanding it but it, it it's how i look at it on the most simple level yeah i think that's a great example uh and actually if if you study um machine learning well, chances are one of the first things um that you you would learn as a student is uh something called regression and if you have all this data like I studied for this many hours for the test and this was the grade I got and if you plotted that on a graph you could draw a line through those and it's not a perfect line uh but uh not every point's going to be on the line you can't you know you'd have to put a lot of jagged edges in there but if you could draw the straightest line you could and uh uh that, that that like kind of fit through all the data points um that's called regression and uh its job is to find the m and the b it's uh it's uh it's really where a lot of this starts and uh there's there's so many uh, applications where that's that's exactly what happens so i think that's a great example um and so this idea of applying that to text then seems so kind of weird because it uh it, th those are numbers and you're fitting something to a line um I guess in, in yeah. computing everything is really a number. So uh, in a way, you're you're matching. I don't know. I'm picturing like the the sound waves of someone's uh, speech and uh, maybe fitting that to some patterns to see for syllables and and look for uh, look for patterns. And uh, you know, I guess you'd be doing some fitting and and parametering there too. I don't know if I got that anywhere near uh, close to the way you do it, but uh, so I can talk a little bit about how that actually works for text. So recently um there is this been this advent of things known as word embeddings which are essentially you have a word and you want to map it to a number specifically a vector and this is how we represent words and um this is what's really being understood by the computer these vectors and like for an example like we talked a, a little bit about different nlp tasks but let's just say for example we're doing something like sentiment analysis trying to understand the emotion from a text using these word vectors and and doing some modeling um a, com a computer a machine learning model would try to decide which words are most indicative of positive sentiment or negative sentiment and then even if um in a future text we didn't use the exact words if the vectors of the words that we use are similar enough it's going to be able to uh, make a prediction about the sentiment of the text. I hope that wasn't too um, too difficult of an explanation, but yeah. it's really just looking at, it's still looking at numbers, but these numbers are a little bit different than just the simple um, integers that you normally see. Yeah, I guess, yeah, you, you can group things and these vectors, uh, which are groups, uh, you know, like uh, like X and Y on a, on a graph uh, would be a vector. Um, and so if you had a group of, of, of words or parts of a word, you could start to look for um, how close a couple of vectors are, how close are, are a few points in a, a graph and look for the closest one maybe uh, or something like exactly. that. Exactly. So, oh yeah, you're, you're classifying text. That's, that's pretty, uh, pretty amazing how, how versatile this stuff is. So yeah, that's a lot of fun. Well, I know you're gonna show us some cool things uh, shortly. So, um, uh, so definitely uh, uh, you can all keep an eye out for that. And uh, uh, for now, uh, maybe we'll leave it there. Uh, so, uh, Adam, thank you so much for, uh, for doing this. This, uh, this. this has been a lot of fun. For me too. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you too. And uh, so we'll see more from Adam uh, very soon. Um, in the meantime, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, you can get more information about uh, this uh, and some of the things you heard about here today, uh, as well as activities uh, that you can try out at home or at school. Um, you can find those on our website at uh, digitalsignature.fm. Uh, and you can keep in touch with us there through the uh, comments uh, section. Um, you can even submit ideas and requests, things you'd like to hear more about. We're just happy to kind of get the, get the message out for you. Um, so we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, and there's a suggestion page there on the website. Uh, and you can even uh, just email me anytime. Just drop a line and say hello. Uh, I'm at uh, bill at digitalsignature.fm. 
Uh, so uh, definitely keep in touch and uh, keep an eye out uh, for more to come. Uh, in the meantime, uh, thanks again so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.